for this next presentation. And this one is gonna be on Factiopia. Uh, after that, after this session, we'll be having a networking session, but uh, because we know it might be late for some of you to network learn. We just want to give opportunity for all of us to say a few things uh, about where we come from, who we are, so that other people will know us and come to us wherever they want um, some kind of uh, collaboration or information from you. And we will also have screening at 8 p.m. Uh, yes, it's late, but as we say this morning, this particular conference happens across three time uh, zones. So we use Eastern Africa, Central Africa, and Western Africa time zone. So for Senegal, Dakar, it is still six o'clock when it's eight o'clock here. So that's why, but we understand if you have to leave, we will share the links of all the videos later on, and you'll also find it on Hova the app. Uh, you will find all the links that you need because all of the sessions are recorded simultaneously in place. Uh, you will also get it on uh, on the app later on. Okay, so let's go to our fact session, uh, fact checking session. Fact checking in Ethiopia. So fact checking has become an evident part of journalism worldwide. How does fact checking fit into the larger media scene in Ethiopia? And what are the synergies and relations with mainstream media? How do fact checking initiatives, each um, initiatives reach their audiences? And how are they provide, provided by people in this age of massive disinformation? So those are the points that our panelists are going to be discussing on. So please help me in welcoming our panelists, three fact checkers, Elias Meseret, Kia Ali, and Rohobot Ayaleo. Elias, Kia, and Rohobot. So let me start by introducing Elias first. Elias Meseret is an Ethiopian journalist working currently as an editor at Ethiopia Check, the country's biggest fact-checking desk, which he founded in early 2020. He worked as a correspondent for the AP news agency for eight years, also now working as a freelance journalist for various media outlets. Elias is also president of the Ethiopian Mass Media Professionals Association. Uh, so that is Elias Meseret. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the second speaker is Rohobot. Uh, Rohobot Ayaleo is the lead fact checker at uh, Hag, Hag Check, one of the pioneering fact checking initiatives in Ethiopia. She also gives fact checking trained journalists and the youth. Uh, before Hag Check, uh, Rohobot has worked with Adi Zaybe and Care Ethiopia. Uh, she uh, has a Bachelor's of Arts in Economics from Ambo University. And Kia Ali is uh, from Code for Africa. And uh, Kia Ali is currently working for Code, of, Code for Africa as a fact checker on the initiative called uh, PESA Check. PESA Check, Africa's largest indigenous fact checking organization, debunking misleading claims and deciphering uh, the often confusing numbers quoted by public figures in 12 African countries. Before joining PESA Check, she used to work for the, the European uh, Journalism Center as an expert at the initiative dubbed uh, Interrupter. Africa, sorry, you'll have to <laughs> correct it later. Uh, and it was a monthly uh, newsletter that provides a roundup of the main headline 
news from Africa by women journalists. The primary objective uh, was to amplify, to amplify the voices of women journalists and experts. Also, she worked as a reporter for the Ethiopian Business Review magazine, and Kia is interested in fact-checking, investigative journalism, gender e equality, inclusion, and economics. So thank you, my panelists, and I really, really appreciate your time um, and uh, your, um, your thank you for being here to share your experiences. So uh, my panelists today, they will be covering three different areas, even though it's all about fact checking, uh, they have three specific topics. And after that, I'll ask, I'll ask them a few questions and I will open the floor uh, to you, to the audience so that you can ask them and uh, get clarification. So I will start with Elias. So Elias Meseret from Ethiopia Czech, he will be uh, telling us about challenges and opportunities as well as the state of misinformation and disinformation in Ethiopia. So I will give the floor to Elias um, and you can continue your presentation. Can I share the screen? It's not allowing me. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Mehti. Uh, the introduction is already done, so I'll go straight to my presentation. <clears throat> Today, uh, I'll make my presentation uh, uh, on behalf of the fact-checking desk that I work with, which is Ethiopia Check. Uh, Ethiopia Check. Uh, I will explain a bit about the check and then we'll go straight to my uh, topic, which is uh, explaining about the challenges and opportunities in fact check in Ethiopia. The check started uh, first in April uh, 2020. It was my uh, personal initiative and later on uh, it became a project and then uh, beginning from June 2020, uh, there are four people working at the desk. So. Uh, uh, actually, three months ago, we also started Afano Romo and Tigrinya language. So, uh, as much as possible, uh, we try to debunk claims that we uh, uh, receive uh, from our followers. We have uh, more than 100,000 followers, for example, on Facebook, we are on Twitter, and also on Telegram, and we have also websites, and also we also regularly conduct monitoring. So, based on that, we uh, conduct fact checking. Uh, just to give you a highlight of some of the, our coverage, probably uh, some of you might already follow it, Patrick. Uh, these were some of the coverage from the conflict uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, uh, just to give you a highlight, we conduct uh, monitoring of uh, social media pages, uh, mainstream media outlets, and also uh, give coverage um, to uh, uh, activists who have massive social media followers uh, because that's where uh, some of the problems lie. And also, as you see on the right, there are some uh, regular works that we conduct in terms of fake news alerts in which we monitor fake accounts and then uh, after uh, conducting due diligence and the proper investigation, we alert our followers. <clears throat> and this is our coverage from the election that uh, Ethiopia conducted in June uh, 2021. Uh, as you can see at the top, at the left, uh, some doctor's images can be seen. Uh, in the middle, you can see uh, state, media, state news agency uh, uh, coming up with uh, an incorrect story, which we corrected on the election day. On the right, you can see uh, also we covered some issues um, related to the international media, for example, as you can see here, CNN uh, uh, misquoted uh, one opposition figure, and 
um, fortunately, after several people uh, uh, mentioned uh, CNN, they were later uh, able to correct their story. So this is uh, just a highlight. I know uh, Rob and Kia will uh, provide more details about their fact-checking work, which some of which we also covered. Just to explain uh, in a minute or two about the state of misinformation and disinformation in Ethiopia. Some of uh, these are the issues that you already know. There is a steady rise of uh, misinformation in Ethiopia as more and more people continue to uh, get the news from social media. Some bad actors um, uh, are using this opportunity to disseminate uh, misinformation and disinformation. And uh, as you all know, uh, there is a conflict in Ethiopia. Recently, uh, Ethiopia also conducted a general election, and then there are some tensions that we observe um, uh, most often these days. So these developments in Ethiopia have particularly uh, give rise to misinformation and disinformation because uh, whether it is activists or ordinary social media users, uh, they are trying to use social media as a place where uh, they create influence and also uh, mobilize uh, their support base. And also, uh, there is a low media literacy in Ethiopia. According to the latest figure that I have, uh, the media literacy rate is around 16%, which is extremely low even in uh, African standard. So, which means that uh, the low media literacy rate has contributed for the, uh, the dissemination of misinformation because most people receive information and then they don't know how to consume it. They don't conduct the proper uh, due diligence or fact checking that they are able to conduct by themselves. And then when such things are lacking, it means that um, uh, the ground is uh, fertile for the, the dissemination of false information. And also there are a lack of a good number of uh, fact-checking initiatives, as you can see here. There is PESA check, uh, HAC check, and TEPIA check. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any other organizations that are uh, uh, conducting fact-checking. Uh, at TEPIA check, for example, there are only four people working, and every day we get several dozens, I will say, some days when there are some controversial issues. For example, we get 150, 200 claims, but uh, we really have a limited capacity uh, to conduct fact-checking on those these items. And this shows that uh, there are very few initiatives and then uh, the already existing ones are now bombarded with requests for claims to verify some uh, scams, for example, which we are regularly working on uh, in recent weeks. And then the other one is uh, obvious polarized media and political atmosphere, uh, which is forcing people uh, to disseminate um, uh, Photoshop images, fake videos, and now we are seeing very sophisticated audio uh, files. Probably uh, you may have encountered such in recent uh, months. And uh, uh, the election, I think, has contributed uh, to that one as well. And also, uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, the recent cabinet has uh, included um, some officials which will be, uh, which we all hope will be open to the, for the media. And also there is a communication office which was announced. So uh, we believe that uh, that office will be able to give timely and relevant information because in the past, with all the things that are uh, happening in Ethiopia, uh, most journalists and fact checkers were not able to get accurate information. So when journalists and fact checkers don't get the information that they need, uh, for example, they might leave the story uh, and that will uh, enable the bad actors on the social media to continue doing what they do. Uh, now I will go straight to the challenges and opportunities that uh, the fact checking in Ethiopia uh, presents. And the, the first one is the one that I mentioned right uh, 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 before this, which is the restriction on access to information. Uh, uh, as Meti uh, mentioned during the introduction, I'm the head of the Ethiopian uh, Mass Media Professional Association. And when I talk to the journalists, the, one of the major issues that they raise is the access to information. So even when at the times when there is access to information, government media outlets will be given the priority. And when some specific questions are forwarded to some ministries, they are not um, willing or able or some issues which uh, we don't really understand, they are not responsive. So that has really um, enabled uh, for, for the massive uh, uh, disinformation 
uh, that we see uh, on social media. And the other one is the communication blackout and travel restrictions that are in place in various parts of Ethiopia uh, also contributed to this because to some areas when claims are made, when fact checkers and journalists want to fact check by uh, calling those uh, their sources or people on the ground or eyewitnesses, that's not possible. So this has really impacted uh, our work. And also, uh, as you know, there are some restrictions, travel restrictions to some areas, which also restrict the journalists to make the movement that they want to uh, conduct. And there are increasing threats and also harassment against fact checkers and journalists, which is um, now becoming very evident. You might have come across uh, such kind of um, uh, unfortunate uh, incidents that are increasing when journalists write some stories, then they will be treated and harassed. Uh, which I believe will be uh, is uh, uh, an intentional move to discourage them from doing what they do. Uh, this is the other one. And also there is a lack of deep knowledge in the field. Uh, for example, at Ethiopia Czech, uh, we have conducted training for more than 90 journalists within the past year. And when we speak with them and we have related that, there is very uh, low level of understanding about fact-checking and also uh, they are not aware of the online, for example, there are some free tools available online, they are not even aware of that. So uh, I think there is also lack of knowledge and also wider reach. I mean, it's a bad check, as I mentioned, has maybe like 100,000 followers on Facebook, but many uh, other media outlets are not carrying our content, for example. We get a lot of reaction, but for example, in Kenya, uh, I know PESA Check's work is carried by various uh, newspapers that exist in Kenya, like the Star, the Standard, and Daily Nation, which is not uh, happening in Ethiopia, but we are working on that, and we'll, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, accomplish that soon. And also there is a lack of support and incentive for uh, fact-checking initiatives. Uh, I know for a fact there are some journalists who are uh, personally doing such kinds of uh, fact-checking uh, online by themselves, but I believe there should be more support both from the international community, from the government and from NGO so that they will be able to conduct their activities in a robust manner. And when it comes to the opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes we get uh, several dozens of requests which show that there is a demand for verification and fact checking. So. Uh, I think um, uh, fact-checking institutions and also media outlets should capitalize on this and media outlets should also engage in fact-checking. The other one is uh, I'm witnessing also more and more uh, interest from the international community and support from uh, outside. Um, uh, that, that is coming in a form of like support, for example, in uh, kind and also uh, in funding. So that's also a good sign for me. And more and more creative tools are available online. Uh, for example, image verification, video verification, and uh, audio verification tools are now available online. So I think the technology is also supporting the field, which is a good sign. For, and the other one is some online platforms are also conducting fact-checking in a personal initiative, uh, which is good. Uh, I know a couple of uh, some online, uh, mainly online media outlets who are trying to conduct fact-checking, which is an increasing sign that they are also going to engage in such activities. And lastly, I would say it is a very uh, rewarding job. I mean, uh, many people who follow our page are very appreciative of the work that we are doing, which by itself is very rewarding, but it would have been great. I mean, um, if it would have been great if you, for example, uh, are able to reach more people in other languages and also if you can expand uh, our capacity so that maybe we'll have a team of 10, 15 people, but uh, the job itself is very rewarding. And uh, our goal, uh, my, this is my last slide, our goal is to expand our reach with more languages. We hope uh, that uh, maybe in the near future we'll launch uh, Somali and Afa languages. And also we will train more journalists. As I mentioned earlier, so far we have managed to reach around 90 journalists. And uh, we are also in talk with some media outlets so that they will be able to conduct uh, uh, fact checking by establishing their own fact checking disk. This is also in progress. And also collaborating with uh, other local and uh, regional fact checking institutions so that our work will be uh, more, it will have more reach. I think uh, time is up and uh, this will be the end of my presentation. Thank you for uh, listening. Thank you so much, Elias. Uh, it's very good to know the challenges and opportunities around fact checking in Ethiopia. Uh, I think another good thing that's coming up uh, lately is uh, 
back in the days, it was media that we used to trust. But now with all this uh, multiple sources, people uh, require more and more fact checking. So uh, that makes your jobs really relevant. So uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So next, let's go to Kia. And um, uh, uh, Kia, I know you're going to present about how misinformation and disinformation uh, in mainstream media uh, uh, is disseminated. And uh, you are also here to share some success fact checking. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kia. As uh, Matt introduced me, and I'm from Pesacek. Before directly going to my presentation, let me say a few things about Pesacek. Pesacek is the last, uh, the largest uh, fact-checking initiative in Africa that that has initiative in 12 African countries. And basically, we do fact-checking reports. We train journalists and newsroom managers, and also we are supporting NGOs and different media to establish uh, a separate fact-checking desk. And also, we are also working on technology technologies, machine learning and artificial intelligence to make misinformation uh, automatic. That being said, in this session, I'm going to cover about like how fact, uh, how misinformations are disseminated in mainstream medias. And uh, like one of, let, let me start from the challenge. You know, because in addition to what Elias has already mentioned, because of uh, movement rest restrictions or because of uh, internet blackout or sometimes because of the political atmospheres, uh, like the journalists may not get the, the, the right type of information from the right type of person. So in that case, they might be dependent, you know, getting their information from their sources. While they are doing that, uh, yeah, next, next. So while they are doing that, if they don't do a proper verification on the information they are doing, they might end up, you know, disseminating misinformation on their medias. Let me support my statement with evidence. For instance, in 2018, uh, there was this, uh, this video that, as you can see on the screen, one video was disseminated on one of the mainstream media platforms, and the video claims that one of the ethnic groups were pushing the bodies of uh, like another ethnic group person into a shallow grave. And uh, during that time, an ethnic tension between the two uh, groups, and when this information was disseminated on the mainstream media, the ethnic tension was intensified and actually there was an actual violence that was happened in Ethiopia. And not only Ethiopia, uh, those people who are living in Somalia and in Djibouti were also at subjected to attack and their properties was looted. But later on, uh, it was like, it was uh, fact, uh, it was found out that this video was fake and actually even the audio was doctored. And uh, this video was initially, uh, you know, or prior to that media house, it was uh, broadcasted in Cameroon as well. The consequence was a deadly violence and, uh, you know, um, looting of properties. The other one is, uh, actually, you know, uh, following the, you know, the, currently there is uh, a violence or a war in the northern parts of Ethiopia. And following that, there was a claim that there was a, a massacre in Aksum. And following, following that claim or that allegation, one, one of the newspapers in Ethiopia were publishing a stories on their front page. And the story said that uh, US aid team were sending an investigation team to, to Tigray region and that they, they debunked that there was no a massacre in Aksum. But actually this story was false and USF team said that they haven't sent uh, an investigation to an, an investigation team to Tigray region. So as you can see from um, the examples, private medias as well as government, uh, uh, government or state owned medias can disseminate misinformations. So if this is a problem, so what can we do to prevent the dissemination of misinformation in the mainstream medias? One of the, the possible solution could be, next slide. Uh, some of the possible uh, uh, solution could be empowering journalists. So if we are empowering reporters, newsroom, man newsroom managers and editors on the basics of fact-checking uh, principles before they are disseminating any type of information that are coming to them, they can do an investigation, right? So by doing that, they can we can fight misinformation. The other one is it's also possible to encourage uh, or and also to build the capacity of the journalists and encourage them to 
to use uh, different technologies and op open source verification tools. For instance, if the media house was uh, doing uh, an investigation or a proper investigation by using technologies on the on the videos, you know, they can easily figure out that the video was previously, you know, broadcast in Cameroon, so they were refraining from you know, disseminating that kind of uh, video. So capacity, the, uh, build, building the capacity of journalists and encouraging them to use technology is another uh, possible solution. And the other one is it's also, as a PESA check, we are encouraging uh, media houses to set up as a Paris fact checking. So they can, you know, they, in, in addition to every story before they are before they went on air or publication, you know, in addition to passing to the, the editorial process, the fact checking this can also do uh, a fact checking and the last one is it's also possible for the journalists to collaborate with um, fact checkers so if any any journalists come to us we are willing to do a fact checking so collaboration among journalists as well as establishing a good network between journalists and fact checkers can also be possible that being said you know these uh, these solutions are not just uh, theoretical actually they are practical and as a PESA check, for instance, currently we are holding uh, different fellowship, uh, different trainings and fellowship programs. And one of them was like, uh, currently we are holding a four months fellowship program. And in this fellowship program, in addition to training journalists, we are also, or one of the pre-requests was for the journalists who are taking part in this fellowship program was to produce checking reporters and published on the, the website or in their media houses. So this will give them an opportunity, you know, even to test whether their audiences are interested on fact checking reporters or not. So after uh, we are starting this fellowship program in September, uh, in August, in, in September, one of the media houses called um, Artist TV already, the, the journalists who are taking part in the fellowship program really understand the importance of setting up a separate fact checking desk and they are going to their uh, executive uh, managers, they convince them and they actually set up a separate fact checking desk and they are producing fact checking reports. In addition to that, uh, Addis Media as uh, Addis uh, Media also created a separate fact checking section on their website and they are starting to produce fact checking and the editor told me that they are committed to continue producing fact-checking reports even after the end of the fellowship program. So we are considering this as a success story. And if these uh, media houses can can integrate fact-checking into the ministry in, the, in their media houses, the other, other media houses also can do this possible to integrate fact-checking into the ministry media house. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. Uh, it's actually really uh, refreshing to know that media houses are very serious about fact checking and they dedicated resources and stuff to do fact checking whenever they do their news and stories. Uh, this is uh, this is very uh, promising and very um, encouraging, actually. So it's good to know which media to follow because now we know which media have their fact checking team uh, intact and working. Uh, so thank you for informing us that. Uh, now let me take you to our next presenter, Rehobot from Hag Check, and Rehobot is going to be uh, is going to tell us about how uh, fact checking initiatives are perceived by the audience. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Matty. Um, can you go to the third slide? Uh, so first, let me tell you about uh, Hag Check. Uh, Hag Check is in mixed. Uh, Hack Check is a local fact checking uh, initiative uh, uh, established under Addis Abbey Media Digital Media Newsroom. So uh, we started uh, around uh, 10 months ago and uh, it was established in the newsroom. So uh, after 10 months of fact checking and uh, in house capacity building, we we registered into a CSO called uh, Inform Africa. So uh, in, uh, in hack check, uh, we do uh, multilingual fact checking. So uh, we do in, in English and we translate those fact checking to Amharic, um, uh, Somali, uh, Tigrayna and Afano Romo so that uh, we could reach more of the, the, the general public and the wider uh, audience. Uh, 
so in in the first uh, uh, ten months, we uh, used to uh, we used to uh, we used to be under a DZB, so we used to follow the trends of the newsroom and uh, uh, we work under the newsroom. But uh, starting from September, the new year in Ethiopia, we uh, transferred to uh, any identity and we, we re-established the hack check as a new uh, fact checking initiative. Uh, so uh, it's under SSO, so uh, thankful and we're really thankful for our partners, uh, UNESCO, AMES, uh, Africa Czech, and other partners uh, who helped us in uh, building the capacity to, to, to grow and to uh, empower others. So uh, the, uh, can you go to the next? Yeah, as you can see, we've been uh, doing different fact-checking uh, works before uh, we, were, we were in uh, this area and also after uh, we became in uh, Inform Africa. So, uh, right after, sorry. <laughs> so, um, we don't only do fact checkings uh, when there is uh, an information shortage or when we couldn't find uh, evidences. We usually do analysis on uh, controversial topics and uh, other issues. For example, uh, I can mention uh, some uh, analysis we did on COVID vaccine and. Uh, uh, even COVID itself, and also uh, when the, the conflict in Tigray broke out, uh, there was a claim by Ethiopia Telecom that 39.8 uh, uh, billion uh, cyber attack was attempted on the uh, telecom service, and we tried to check, but uh, due to shortage, shortage of resource, uh, we couldn't uh, verify or we couldn't give the, verify the, the the content and the information, but we, what we could do was uh, do analysis on uh, the issue by um, by um, talking with experts and by looking at the best uh, evidences uh, in the world wide. So uh, uh, based on our our trend and our our experts' uh, uh, work, uh, what we do is not only also uh, different analysis and on. Uh, controversial issues. Uh, the other thing that we have as an uh, strength is that, as I said earlier, we are multilingual and also we do a weekly and monthly disinformation trend analysis, which is uh, which we will send to journalists, different uh, media outlets, and also uh, other media stakeholders, uh, so that the the people and the public should be more aware of the disinformation trend in Ethiopia. And uh, we also give a recommendation for uh, based, on the, based on the trends that we see. So this is one of our strengths. And the other one is audio fact checking uh, content. So we've started a YouTube show of uh, fact checking uh, over for the past two months. So, uh, what we are doing is uh, we analyze the week and we, we do a, an analysis of uh, a weekly disinformation trend in audiovisual content so that we can we could reach more people and we could uh, uh, we could more we could teach the public about fact checking and what media literacy is uh, so that uh, we can reach um, the general public the other one is the other one, strengths uh, we have is that we we have a newsroom that can support us uh, as as uh, kia was uh, earlier mentioning earlier uh, newsroom and media, uh, mainstream media can be, can be integrated with uh, uh, fact checking. So, uh, as, uh, as hack check was uh, formerly established in the newsroom, it's one of our strengths, and we are still collaborating with the Addis Abe newsroom. Uh, so, that is one of our strengths. Uh, the other one is we have uh, an internship program where we mentor uh, university students and fresh graduates uh, to do uh, fact checking and uh, uh, to be more aware about the disinformation trade in Ethiopia and uh, to to um, to empower the youth and uh, to empower more fact checkers in Ethiopia. Uh, next slide. So about my topic, uh, how fact checking initiatives are reaching uh, our 
audiences. So uh, as most of the disinformation trend we, we observe are mainly uh, circulating on social media. One of uh, the main uh, way we reach our audiences are social media itself. Uh, so all of us have uh, websites that we could uh, publish our stories. Uh, uh, and also uh, we use social media platforms like, like Facebook, Twitter, Telegram, and YouTube to, to, to let the public know about the fact checking we do and uh, to teach uh, some media literacy tips for the public. Uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, we also reach for uh, journalists and uh, media uh, outlets and also stakeholders through a newsletter, weekly and a monthly newsletter. So, that's one way of uh, our audience reach. Uh, the other one is how audience, uh, the audience are perceiving our, our contents and how the audience is uh, perceiving fact checking. So uh, there are different challenges that we are facing uh, regarding this because uh, there is no awareness about fact checking and also there is no uh, there is low media in Ethiopia, so uh, being perceived by the, the audience is uh, one of the, the main challenges that we are facing because uh, whenever we do fact checking, they don't even know that uh, we exist. I mean, uh, the word fact checking is uh, just being introduced to the Ethiopian uh, uh, audience. So one of the, the challenges that we face in uh, being perce perceived is um, awareness. The other one is uh, bias and labeling. So whenever we do fact checking, based on, uh, especially in this time of conflict, whenever we do uh, fact checking, uh, there are bias and labels that we're given and there are names that we are called. And uh, uh, even though we, we put the evidence and even though we are based on uh, factual information, there are still uh, no, not being accepted and uh, it's based on sometimes based on their own bias and also uh, just by hatred so uh, that's the other challenge that we uh, we face the other one is on bullying so uh, it's one of i think it's uh, one of the challenge every journalist uh, not only uh, fact checkers but every journalist uh, uh, face because uh, if as we are as we are a digital on digital uh, world or as we are on digital medias uh, most of the most of the contents and most of the the fact checking we do are sensitive and more more open to the public so uh, there is online uh, bullying on fact checkers and uh, labels and names that are given so that makes uh, our our well, our reach uh, very challenging uh, i think to to uh, face this kind of uh, problems, uh, what we can do. I, I think already Pesachics are partners with Facebooks and the uh, social media platform. So that will make it easier to reach more, more, more audiences because the platforms can, all, can, can um, publish their stories or, uh, and embed their stories on the false information themselves. So uh, I think collaborating with different organization and uh, the, so the social media Media platforms is uh, uh, can be one of the the way to face this challenge. Yeah, if you have any question. Thank you very much, Rohobot. Um, yes, you really detailed out uh, uh, what how the audience perceives it, and also congratulations in such a short period of time, you actually are achieving a big deal. So. Really, I want to congratulate you on that and keep up the good work, all of you, all the three of you. So you can see Ethiopia Czech, Pesa Czech, and Hag Czech. They are doing their best to keep us uh, informed with facts and truths. So uh, please give them one round of applause. And yeah, thank you. Good. Uh, on uh, so let's let me just throw two questions. One from Hova and uh, one of my, my own, and then we'll open the floor. So uh, Brahan Dejan uh, on Hova asked, "How do you empower journalism?" Uh, and I think fact uh, journalism uh, for academicians. 
up checking. So I think uh, it's uh, how do you empower academicians about fact checking? Uh, let's uh, uh, rephrase it like that. And my question is, you know, the challenge comes from journalists themselves when it comes to fact checking. They are very much uh, self-censored. So uh, how do you find this as a challenge uh, when journalists do self-censorship uh, because they, that prevents them from actually pursuing? So those are the two questions. Whoever feels like answering, uh, you can answer. So the first one is about academicians. The second is journalists' self-censorship. I think I can uh, respond to the issue of uh, journalists and fact checkers uh, having to censor themselves on some stories. Uh, I believe it was the uh, Ugandan, the former Ugandan president, uh, Idi Amin, who said, there is a freedom of speech, but I cannot guarantee freedom after speech. Uh, I think somehow this summarizes uh, what's happening here uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, I haven't come across uh, journalists and also me as a journalist, I uh, haven't been told not to write a story, a specific story uh, in my uh, journalistic career. Uh, there have been several occasions in which uh, I was uh, threatened, uh, I was harassed and also uh, was also, uh, to, I was also told that my accreditation was revoked and uh, uh, with the intervention of some other stakeholders, uh, it was returned to me. Uh, with the current context in Ethiopia, uh, especially after the conflict in Tigray, uh, as you know, the uh, conflict coverage has been, uh, it has many uh, faces and uh, um, with that, I can say with my conversation with several journalists who are with our association, the Ethiopian Mass Media Professional Association, who number more than 500, by the way. And uh, uh, there are some topics which they are not covering uh, because they fear that there will be consequences in the form of harassment, bullying, the one that uh, Robert was mentioning earlier, and also fearing arrest also uh, in recent weeks, months, we have seen some journalists uh, who have been detained. I'm not going to uh, the specifics because this might be something that is still uh, uh, in the legal process. But uh, I have to admit uh, to, I mean, and be honest in saying that there is somehow a climate of fear uh, when it comes to covering some certain topics because journalists fear that uh, their bosses, their editors will not be happy. They will be. They will. They will be. They will lose their job. Uh, they will be harassed by social media actors, by activists. Nowadays, you have this. Uh, some of you might have. I don't want to make this my issue, but you might have seen my picture and posting, and then trying to give me some names, labels. It's just an example. You will see several journalists and fact checkers and. Uh, uh, independent commentators coming uh, under such attack. So definitely, uh, I can for sure say that there is some level of censorship when it comes to covering certain topics, and it has really impacted uh, on uh, the media landscape in Ethiopia because people have the right to know what's happening in this country, and then when journalists are not free to report uh, whatever feels, whatever they feel like the public should know, and then there is a problem. And that problem is, I believe, and getting a momentum. And uh, I believe that uh, there needs to be some kind of intervention by all stakeholders. And with the new government uh, installed, I believe there is uh, we, we will steer, steer away from such practices, but unfortunately, this is the reality. Thank you. So how do you empower uh, academicians about fact checking uh, if you have examples or if you have done such kind of trainings? Basically, we are doing our uh, empowerment tra training on, uh, on journalists. 
but like providing the basics or the training on the basics of fact checking principle can also help academicians because if they know the how like the difference between misinformation disinformation and malinformation like the characters the characteristics of misinformation when they are doing their research for instance when they are doing literature review they can you know they can easily discern the quality researches from like those that are not based on uh, you know credible sources so the, knowing the characteristics of the you know this misinformation but the data say something like that will help academic academicians as well to do uh, a good research yeah um yeah so as i said earlier to to give uh, trainings and in in mentorship for uh, uh, students and uh, journalists student, students and uh, fresh graduates so uh, i think uh, this is also part of uh, empowering uh, the youth and also academic academicians because uh, they are the, the the future and they are going to 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 do more if they have the base uh, from the beginning so and also our experts also collab with uh, different organization and give trainings for for social media activists and uh, journalists so that can be also an example Thank you very much. So uh, I will open the floor. Uh, she uh, will give the mic. Let's uh, uh, microphone. Uh, so uh, we will just need one question and make it very, very precise. And your name, which uh, institution you come from, give it to bro at the back. Uh, yes, your name your uh, institution and one question and brief this is a very time bound session so we only take one question from one person thank you moderator um, in the interest of keeping it very short i'm going to read my question um, you might have heard a recent revelation by Facebook whistleblower who accused the platform of basically amplifying problematic content due to its algorithm. Unfortunately, Ethiopia is mentioned as one of the countries in which Facebook, and I quote, literally is fanning ethnic violence. You guys are doing your fact-checking work online, and most of these problematic content appear online, so it makes sense. Um, Add to that the fact that Facebook is one of the most popular social media platforms. So my question is, in light of these facts, one, how do you gauge the effectiveness of your work on a platform which, by design, undercuts your efforts to counter mis- and disinformation and hate speech? Don't you think you guys are set up for failure? That's one. Two, what do you think should one. be done as okay. fact checkers as part of one question? Sorry as part of um, what do you think should be done as fact checkers to hold Facebook accountable? Thank you. Um, uh, there is, let's first answer this and then if we have time, we'll go back to uh, the audience for another question. So about the, oh. Okay, PaySafeCheck is basically working with uh, Facebook and whenever there is a misinformation that are supported by uh, image, it will, it will flag. So we are rating like different, uh, like the different social media accounts. So that means just like, for instance, when you are seeing a sensitive image on F Facebook, you see that you, it will cover the image, right? And it writes on them that it's sensitive, just like that. Uh, it will Facebook will cover the image and says it, it's misinformation and it will direct link will be attached on that image and it will directly like lead to our website so the people can get why that uh, specific post is uh, why we are saying that like a specific post is misinformation so they, they so we are just bringing them the, the truth right so in that case in that case so if the our target audiences or the Facebook user are coming up with the misinformation as well as the truth or out of fact checking, so they can easily figure out which one is true and which one is false. So in the in the meantime, if when people become aware that they are they are actually that we are doing rating, 
somehow since they don't want to lose their followers, since they, they, since they don't want to uh, lose their credibility, so they will in the long run they will become more responsible. So I think that's how we are measuring our impact. Um, so uh, I have uh, I also understand his concern because uh, I think it's before two weeks that uh, we came across a Facebook advertisement or a sponsored post that was uh, impersonating Ethiopia Telecom. So Facebook was actually paid to advertise that that content, but in fact, when it's uh, a false uh, advertisement. So uh, I also agree with him because. Uh, Facebook's algorithm is still uh, not familiar with the Ethiopian context, and the 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 I think the uh, the AI machine or the AI generated contents uh, are not familiar with the the context of Ethiopia. So uh, most of the disinformation uh, and misinformation can be uh, disseminated uh, using that platform itself uh, because of the. There is no uh, uh, office of Facebook based in Ethiopia, and there are no uh, many um, uh, content moderators uh, for Ethiopian context. And as we are uh, a very big, uh, uh, as we have a very big uh, ethnicity group, and uh, uh, as we have uh, many languages, uh, I think the AI general AI machine can't, can't understand the context and also the languages. So that's one way, one of the reasons. Uh, uh, Facebook itself is uh, disseminating uh, disinformation. So, as a solution, uh, I think that uh, Facebook should work with uh, local initiatives, so so that uh, we could understand the context and so that uh, we could have a more rich and more resource resource uh, based on the the information that is disseminated. Because uh, if you, if we are if they are not working with the local initiatives and uh, if they don't understand the local context i don't think there there could be change or i don't think they could uh, uh, there could be any solution for that okay uh i think i've seen some hand yes uh no no i zaga i've seen one hand that's coming uh oh you had a chance earlier so let me give it to maya and i haven't I haven't gotten any question, Zigalamaya. Uh, keep it very brief because we are about to go to the next session. Thank you. I'll keep it very brief. Um, I know that what you're basically doing and your work includes um, investigation and, and it's a fact checking investigation. So I'm curious to know what are you know the difficult ones to kind of find or to, to fact check and what makes them difficult and also what are the what are the you know the common ones as well the very common ones within the ethiopian context thank you okay uh, i really wished i if i could uh, respond to Mick, uh, mickey's uh, question that he raised about facebook and then proceed to uh, the next question uh, i think for most of us uh, the revelation by the whistleblower uh, who was a former employee of facebook it didn't come as a surprise uh, for me, it was not a surprise. Uh, I met the Facebook, uh, um, uh, some of the staff uh, in a meeting that they have here uh, two years ago, and I have exchanged business cards. So I have been in touch with them for quite some time. And in personal capacity, for example, I have been sending them various, I've never been, and I'm still not an employee of Facebook, but I have been sending them very harmful content, fake accounts created in the name of politicians, prominent people and stuff, and they were doing nothing about it. And at some point, I recall it was some six months ago, I sent them a content which I believe is inappropriate, and then they were asking me to translate it into English for them. And you can imagine, this is one of the biggest uh, companies not only social media companies, but one of the biggest companies in the world, and they are asking me to translate it for them. So I think there is negligence uh, in a massive scale, and I don't think Facebook is uh, equipped well enough to uh, monitor the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, sometimes I have, I have asked them in a number of occasions, for example, how many people do they have to monitor content, and they will never tell you about that. And I'm not sure whether it is understaffing or the inability or uh, 
unwillingness. I'm not sure about that, but in a country like Ethiopia, I know some countries like Uganda, they are asking them and they are forcing them to open uh, an office in Kampala so that they will closely monitor their activities and also will uh, hold them accountable. That's not happening in Ethiopia. And uh, I think the latest figure that I have is that there are around 8.5 million active Facebook users in Ethiopia. And this is a country of more than 110 million people. And the social media users are increasing around 17% every, every year. So with this growth and with this demand for Facebook, for many Ethiopians, internet means Facebook. I mean, I mean, most people who don't even use a browser or an email use Facebook. So I don't think they are giving much attention. So uh, I know the new uh, Ethiopian legislation, the hate speech and misinformation legislation puts uh, uh, some kind of uh, responsibility for them, for example, to take down harmful content in a form of hate speech for hours. I mean, whether they are following it, I really doubt that they are up to their job. So I think uh, you raised a very good question and putting them to account, for example, on behalf of Ethiopia, we haven't done anything, but if there is any collaborative effort, then we are ready to take part in that. Personally, uh, a year ago, there was an initiative by Access Now, uh, in which I have signed a petition personally for Facebook to conduct its activities in a responsible manner. Coming to the second question, uh, the difficult ones that I saw while I was conducting fast check in a personal capacity, uh, which I started some four years ago, and still now with the Ethiopia check are the ones related to video and audio, because you have several tools available online, but uh, there are some applications, for example, like Invid, uh, which helps you to detect, it will take automatically screenshots from videos and check whether this is an old video taken from somewhere else in Africa or somewhere else in the world. So videos and audios are normally difficult ones, but there are still some apps. And unfortunately, some of the apps are, uh, I mean, very sophisticated. So it's not, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, somehow you need the knowledge to even to operate the software. So I think uh, audio and video and the easiest ones are mostly related to Photoshop's. I mean, you have several apps and also uh, websites that will help you to determine whether this is a Photoshop or not. So I think that's the easiest one, but sometimes it's also difficult to uh, fact check claims made by some official. For example, at Ethiopia check, and I think every fact checking uh, disk will not check, uh, for example, opinions of people. We don't fact check that, but quotes and also getting uh, officials to respond to some claims is very difficult. When you talk to some officials, they don't want to respond. For example, when we try to ask uh, about a certain Facebook page, whether it belongs to a certain official or not, they will not get back to you. So it's very difficult. It was important. It, it will even benefit themselves, but they will not respond back to uh, journalists and fact checkers. So that's also some of the uh, problematic ones that I witnessed. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elias, Kia, and Rohobot. It has been such an informative session. By the way, tomorrow morning, the first session will be having as a, a local session, and from Code for Africa, we will have Dawit to uh, give us a demo on how to use one of the platforms for fact checking that is civic signal so that will be a very very useful session because you will know how to use uh, uh, that particular uh, platform and it's live it's open source all right thank you so much please help me in sending back my panelists to their seats but i'm but i'm not missing Thank you. So because uh, this next session, uh, we want to use it for networking. Uh, we have about, I will say, I think we can have about half an hour or about 35 minutes. So I think we are about, well, let's say 35 people. Uh, my maths is never accurate, but let me give you all a maximum of one minute. Uh, if you have been working on live media, radio and TV, you know the, the importance of seconds. So I will give you maximum one minute. We will pass the microphone. Uh, do I have a stand for microphone? 
we don't okay it's okay i will we'll pass the microphone so right after you use the mic you can use the sanitizer on the table so what i want you to do is because we want people to know you and what you do you just get up and you say my name is uh, so let me introduce myself. My name is Meti Shwaye Yilma. I am a broadcast producer and host, and my company's name is Quindam Media. I'm here to connect with TV and radio producers, story writers, and whoever wants to uh, connect with me regarding production. I'm your girl. So that's it. What you do, your name, where you come from, what you do, and who you want to connect with. And then we will know and we will come to you whenever we have those kind of uh, questions. And you can also put your contact details on uh, Huava. Uh, it, and if you have business cards, you can switch later on. So where shall we start from? Which corner is the lucky corner? Okay, let's start with Sophie. Thank you. Uh, most of you I have introduced myself to. Uh, so again, hello, I'm Sophie. I'm the project manager for Foyo IMS here in Addis. I've been in Addis since January and I'm really here to connect and also to provide facilitation. And I would like to talk with each of you. So uh, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Nice to meet you again. My name is Ilham Ali. I'm a communications officer for Foy IMS in Addis, and I would love to connect with every one of you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lars. Uh, I'm uh, head of development at uh, Foyo, based in Stockholm, and very happy to be with you here. I cannot select anyone. I, I really want to talk to all of you. I'll talk more tomorrow when I will introduce a concept that we call sustainable journalism. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brahan Rajan from Waldea University. I'm an instructor in journalism, and currently I'm Dean of the Faculty. So anyone interested to work with universities to empower students Therefore, we are willing to support you and working together. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Rashwit Mukundu. I'm a Zimbabwean journalist working as an uh, advisor, Sub-Saharan Africa at International Media Support. Um, I'll be happy to meet all of you and get to know you. Thank you. My name is Masood, and I come from the Consortium of Ethiopian Human Rights Organizations. Uh, and we mainly work on human rights, democracy, and peace building. And if any of you are interested uh, for our freedom of expression uh, components of our, so our workers, you are welcome. Our office is located at uh, next to Friendship uh, on Afomi building. Uh, and by profession, I'm a lawyer. Thank you. Should I come? Elias Musarat Balalo. Uh, my name is Fasika. I, I am a journalist and currently working for Bloomberg News. And as Ilham said, I want to meet everyone. Since I'm a journalist, I love connecting with people. So I will talk to you all. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Maya Masakur. I'm a reporter and an editor for Ethiopia Insight. Um, yeah, I'll look forward to talking with you, uh, people from different organizations uh, during the break. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jamal Mohammed. Uh, I'm from uh, Bahar University. I'm a teacher there, and I was working as a journalist for more than 12 years. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Teshagar Shifarrao. I'm working for Atisaba University School of Journalism and Communication. I'm an instructor. I would like to communicate with all of you, media practitioners and experts. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Blaine Fitzum. Blaine means the apple of your eye, and Fitzum means perfect, so I'm a perfect vision. Uh, for the past 20 years, I've been both a practitioner and uh, a trainer. Uh, media and communication 
is my passion. So whoever is interested in capacity building, I train journalists, I train CSOs, I train political actors, I train international organizations, I train everyone. So whoever is interested in capacity building, I would like to network. But as my colleague earlier said, I'm a people person. I love people. I can't get enough of having conversation with people who have a lot to say. So I'm here to talk with anyone. <laughs> Um, nice to meet you. I'm Nazif Jamal from Romia Journalist Association. So people uh, usually uh, say it wrong, Oromo Journalist Association. We are Oromia Journalist Association. There is a difference between the two. It's, Oromia is a region, Oromo is an ethnic group. So we are Oromia Journalist Association. Uh, the association has uh, more than 600 members. Uh, we would like to connect with uh, like-minded people to develop and um, work in developing our media in Ethiopia and to facilitate our democracy uh, our democracy process. Uh, prior to that, I worked for, for FANA uh, uh, Radio or FBC and professionally radio journalist and also BBC Media Action as health journalist and trainer, producer and uh, presenter. Uh, I, I know 12 people. Uh, out of that, I, I would like to connect and know more about them. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Monet Vixisa. I am a journalist. I come from Romeo Broadcasting Network in Owen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Zalalam from uh, Bahadur University. Um, I am actually uh, from academia. Uh, I do teach journalism there for more than a decade. Um, besides that, uh, we are working hard to establish uh, Ethiopian Journalism Educators Network with the financial auspice of IMS for you and uh, other organizations. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Antana Mokra. I'm also from Bardar. I've been working as a lecturer and a co coordinator for more than uh, 10 years, I can say. Uh, I'm glad to meet all of you. Also. Okay, thank you. My name is Sal Sawit Bainasang. I'm from Walter TV station, also a producer there, and uh, I lead the investigation department. And I am the editor there. Thank you. Shu hula tum salam marsila snoi bala lohi. Iska karubek andres ba wala garu television e program a zaga juna krabi ne. On dagmo media ba mek ayer hidas lene lot. I'm second lot. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Fahmi Jamal from Jimma University, Department of Media and Communication Studies. Uh, I am an assistant lecturer in the Department of Media and Communication, and I am also working on the digital media, which is known as Adizebe, for a short period of time as a mobile journalist from Jimma. Hello, Hello. I am Haimanut from Debra Marcos University. I'm teaching journalism and communication at Debra Marcos University. And currently, I'm a four-year PhD candidate at Bahadur University. Thank you. My name is Masal Zalalam. I'm a reporter. I came from Ashara Media. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am from Bahadur University. My name is Solomon Tabor. Uh, I, I teach at uh, Dilla University. Currently, we are working uh, on uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, providing training to the youths, anybody who is interested to work us to work with us on fact checking, you are uh, welcome, and I would like to connect with all of you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alexander Johannes. I work um, in Dolce Vele Academy as a product manager for the um, fact checking project line. I work closely with Marsa Media Institute and Code for Africa. I'm kind of new here to, um, to DWA, so it'll be exciting to meet everybody here. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name is Yon Mola from MERSA Media Institute. Uh, MERSA is currently working on media reform, institutional capacity building and uh, professionalization. And I would like to meet every one of you as well. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Salam. I'm the project director for Internews, um, running all Internews projects, which is mainly capacity development for journalists and media houses, running the projects from Ethiopia, but we're currently based in Nairobi, but we're in the process of uh, registered here, uh, so hopefully it will happen soon. Um, I think I'm here to connect with all media stakeholders, which I think everyone is here is a stakeholder. So looking forward to learn from everyone and share what I know. Thank you. Salam uh, Hadra Balalohin. Um, I am a freelance journalist and a producer. I also run Nubia Media in communications. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Solomon Goshu. I am a, a, a program officer at IMS for you, uh, the Saba office. And uh, I'm really uh, looking forward to meet you all. Of course, uh, with some of you, uh, we know each other, we are working together, but uh, we also want to uh, connect and uh, to discuss with all of you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Abel. I am affiliated with two organizations. The first one is Addis Abe, one of the emerging local media organization. And also I'm affiliated with Inform Africa, which hosts the Sarkatric and other uh, media uh, development projects. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lamita Spai. I'm a lawyer by training, and uh, I came from Inform Africa and uh, working as a rights researcher. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry, that was loud. My name is Abraham Marita. I work with Internews in Kenya. I'm here to learn um, um, your work in uh, investigative journalism as well as, as well as share what we have been able to do in Kenya. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Robot, and I'm a fact checker at Hack Check in Form Africa. So I look forward to meet and uh, speak with you all. Yeah. Okay, hello. My name is Ishwar Kagirma from Ethiopian Mass Media Authority. I'm the head of public and community broadcast media monitoring department. And uh, we are monitor and support public and community medias. And uh, we are to, um, working with media and the media stakeholders together. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hiro Tafra from BBC Media Action. Uh, I'm here to connect with new faces and reconnect with old friends. Uh, I'm a senior uh, producer. Hello, everyone. I'm Grant Wishard. Um, I've been involved in journalism in the States and in Ethiopia, and I'm here to learn about the work that you all are doing. I look forward to meeting you all. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Kia. I work for Code for Africa on an initiative called PESA Check. And if you are interested in fact checking, contact me. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is Hayamano Tashanafi. I work for BBC Horn of Africa. I'm based in Nairobi. Um, yeah, and I'm here to connect with all of you. And especially if you like coffee, I'm, I'm happy to buy you one. So feel free to reach out. Great. So we got to know everyone, at least by name and which institution they are working with. So we are actually way ahead of time. So we're just improvising right now. Since we have time before the next session, which is a plenary session on rest and journalism that comes alive, uh, I 
would just like to open the floor because early for the other sessions, we rushed you because of the time uh, limitation we had. But if you have burning question to forward to one of the presenters, if you had uh, something that needs to be clarified, then this is your opportunity. So instead of uh, just keeping it open, let's discuss some issues. It could be about fact checking, or it could be from the morning sessions. If we have, I think we have some of the presenters, so we can open up the uh, the, the, the floor to just run a few ideas, discuss a few questions. Good. Oh, wonderful. I have three questions. So I think it's on the fact checking. So should I bring the fact checkers on the stage? Great. So the fact checkers, warmly, you're welcome back to this, to the podium to answer some questions. So we have three hands. So Elias, Kia, and Rohobot, please come back to your, uh, your seats. I know it's uh, an impromptu session, but we don't want our participants to go with their questions in their belly. So good. All right. So we have three questions. So we have about 20 minutes. So a little more than 20 minutes. So it will give us an opportunity. This gentleman here. Okay, uh, thank you again. Uh, my question is on uh, sustainability of uh, these kinds of activities, because we know from time to time that these are very much needed, but technically it is also very difficult to run uh, as individual or as an organization because it, it, it also works on a very uh, hostile environment. So how are fact checking in institutions and individuals to continue? And the other is like, uh, actually, it has been raised with uh, the issue of Facebook, but how are you going to collaborate with social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, or whatsoever, so that these institutions, of course, are sometimes a source of fake news or misinformation, disinformation, but uh, because you are engaging social media platforms to check factors, and if they are at the, at the end not credible, then how, how are you going to work with these institutions? And what is your plan to work with mainstream media? Because the very problem I see is lack of awareness about these kinds of uh, platforms, so that you increase awareness uh, about these issues with the main, uh, I mean, the, the broader community. Thank you. Okay about the sustainability of fact-checking initiatives. I think <clears throat> that is something that we should all uh, think uh, about. I mean, uh, as far as I know, most of the fact-checking initiatives are supported by organizations, uh, uh, international media development organizations, or uh, aid agencies, as far as I know. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, for example, when, whenever there is a shift in foreign policy uh, between uh, two countries, uh, these kinds of initiatives are greatly impacted, and we are already witnessing that one. So I think uh, what comes into play here is that uh, fact-checking uh, initiatives like Ethiopia Check cannot, I mean, become a commercial. Uh, I mean, they cannot, for example, advertise commercial products on their platforms and stuff. Uh, because, I mean, I know, for example, newspapers, uh, it's the right platform to advertise, to invite uh, promoters and then uh, collect money. And as far as I know, in Ethiopia, uh, most of them survive uh, with uh, advertisements that they are running. But for fact-checking initiatives, I believe the best way is not to engage in uh, having like a commercial department department or marketing department and do both sometime. So I think the best way is to find the right partner, whether it is a local uh, um, NGO or governmental, or even governmental organizations, but that will enable the fact-checking initiative uh, to be dependent uh, and also uh, to conduct its activities freely. So what I'm thinking loud here is, I mean, 
there are several organizations like IMS, Internews, uh, and uh, several other organizations that are now showing interest in Ethiopia. So I think they should be uh, supportive of such initiatives because fact-checking initiatives will find it very difficult to, to engage in uh, commercializing their content at the same time because, you know, fact-checking, it comes with a lot of trust uh, because whenever some uh, uh, readers come to, for example, Ethiopia check to verify news, they want the news. They don't want to see advertisements. I think that's what I experienced it, for example, with my social media accounts. So the best way is for uh, international organizations to come and then support them in a sustainable manner so that whenever there is some shaky relationship between two governments, it will not be impacted. Uh, the second uh, question that you raised is collaborate with social media companies for Ethiopia check as far as any social media company is interested to engage we are ready Twitter is not that active in Ethiopia as you know I haven't uh, met any Twitter representative I've been a journalist in Ethiopia for uh, more than 10 years now eight years with uh, Associated Press and now with Ethiopia check and also with the association that I mentioned earlier Twitter is very inactive in Ethiopia uh, I know they have some interactions with Twitter users and Telegram is also very secretive in some of its operations. I mean, they are not known to the majority of the public, but I know with all its problems, Facebook is better in terms of uh, reaching out to some um, uh, organizations like Ethiopia Check. For example, recently they have approached Ethiopia Check to compile a list of fake accounts and impersonating pages so that they will take action. And very recently, maybe it's due to the recent revelation uh, uh, in the US, they have started taking down pages in which we have exposed as fake pages. But I think for Facebook, uh, I mean, uh, at least to get the cred credibility, it should at least start, for example, by verifying very prominent people in Ethiopia. I know one journalist who is very prominent. I didn't want to uh, mention her name here. There are around 16 accounts created in her name, and she is very afraid. Uh, I mean, to even walk on the streets of art is because some of the contents that are posted in some of the fake accounts are very dangerous. And she said that she told me actually that she feared that somebody may kill her because of those contents. And there is Facebook, an organization, I mean, that has billions of dollars of revenues, but it's not doing anything. But after she uh, contacted them, they to manage to take down some of the accounts, but still it's not an active, uh, it's not a verified account. And I'm not sure why several media outlets, especially private media outlets in Ethiopia are not verified with all the problems that we are witnessing uh, in terms of fake accounts. So, I mean, they should be monitor fake accounts and also try to verify prominent people, media outlets, politicians, opposition figures uh, and the like. Otherwise, just sitting on the side and then uh, taking down pages whenever there are complaints and after the damage then is not uh, going to be helpful. Uh, I think that's my observation on this. Thank you. So uh, as uh, he mentioned, so to be sustainable uh, in Ethiopia, uh, as uh, we can understand from uh, other countries and other, other uh, fact-checking initiatives in other countries, uh, uh, most of them are sustainable because of the support they get from uh, different organizations. So uh, I think the support from uh, IMS um, and uh, UNESCO, as I mentioned earlier, and other organizations are really uh, very important uh, to be sustainable. And also the support of the public can be also uh, another opportunity. Uh, uh, and the other question you mentioned is how we can collaborate with these uh, social media platforms. So there is an international fact-checking networks. Uh, so uh, to be a third party fact-checker for Facebook or to collaborate with uh, Facebook, we have to be a signatory in that network. So uh, hack check is uh, in the process of applying for that, uh, uh, that orga to be in the network. So uh, if, the, if, we are if we succeed in uh, being uh, a member of the international fact-checking networks, I think uh, we can uh, collab or we can work with uh, Facebook and. Uh, I think we, we can find a way that uh, that change the, the the recent situation and uh, what's right now in the in the social media platforms. Uh, 
my question is on uh, collaboration amongst the uh, fact checkers in, in Ethiopia. In most countries in Africa, we only have a, a single entity doing fact checking. But just find out from you if you collaborate uh, as fact checkers and uh, on what issues. And the second question is on um, your relationship in terms of your work with international media. I uh, realize that uh, Ethiopia, and I'm sure it's something we share, is now an international story. Um, and have you done any fact checking uh, of uh, international stories and, uh, from the international media? And with what uh, responses in terms of either retractions or, or corrections? Thank you. Okay, in terms of collaboration, PesaCheck is not only working with the journalists, we are also working with fact-checking organizations because relatively PesaCheck has now an experience and it has initiative in 12 African countries. So we are working with uh, like a startup fact-checking organization in Ethiopia. So in addition to empowering journalists, we are also empowering fact-checking organizations. So when, uh, when uh, fact-checkers who are uh, working for uh, different fact-checking fact organizations are important, it means uh, the company or the fact-checking organization will grow as well. So uh, we believe actually in collaboration. So that's how we are working on that. Uh, at Ethiopia Check, for, uh, you mentioned about international media uh and then uh, if you have done something about them uh with all the problems that we are seeing in reporting by uh, international media we have tried to deal with some of them for example one of them was the one that i presented on my uh, uh some minutes ago probably i've seen that a cnn report during election day in ethiopia misquoted one opposition figure so uh, we posted that story as uh because the, that quote was taken from a fake account, a fake Twitter account of uh, the opposition figure. So CNN uh, had re retracted that story and said that uh, they apologized for the story uh, after a lot of people uh, re retweeted that. Um, the other one was, uh, I remember, uh, an AP story in which it quoted that uh, the last uh, rescheduling of the date for the Ethiopia general election was due to the conflict in Tigray, uh, whereas the Ethiopian, the National Ethiopian Election Board has openly stated that it is due to logistical challenges. So we have uh, informed our readers that that was an incorrect story. Uh, no retraction was made by the AP. And also we have alerted our readers about uh, uh, a, a fake quote uh, by uh, BBC monitoring. Uh, it was, I remember, around the election. We have also notified the public about that one. and. Uh, I cannot for sure say that it is due to Ethiopia check, but BBC uh, monitoring has retracted that story as well. So not only social media accounts and local media outlets at Ethiopia check as much as possible, we are also trying to monitor international media outlets. But uh, I can confidently say that most of the fake content, the misinformation and disinformation, and also the hate speech that we are witnessing is coming from local actors. and. Uh, or, or maybe uh, members of the Ethiopian community in the diaspora, mostly the activists. Also, we see content coming from uh, the government side, pro-government activists uh, or groups up to the government. I mean, who organize themselves in various uh, groups and then use social media, for example, to de delegitimize the government and uh, posting all sorts of stories which are not true. So as much as possible, we are also trying to deal with that one at the same time. Uh, trying to deal with the stories by international media outlets. Thank you very much, uh, moderator and the presenters. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is now in Ethiopia, um, <clears throat> we, we have a challenge of uh, ethnification of stories you find here and there. And uh, that goes to uh, the level of some big media who work with different uh, Ethiopian language and they talk about different things. They, they talk about the same thing, uh, but in, in different framing and angles with, with different language. Um, so have, ha, how do you work on that? How do you check? Uh, you are working with three languages and some of you in, in four languages. 
how do you manage that? Have you ever faced that kinds of um, like uh, ethnification can be ignoring some of the some of the uh, non facts issues not to fact check them because it meets their own interests if, if the person the journalist is not really impartial so have you ever um, faced that kinds of problems and how did you correct and another thing is uh, uh, because Ethiopia is now in a conflict and then the conflict area is a dark zone for journalists and that's why so many um, cited stories are coming out which to the level of misinforming the world uh, international audiences as well. Um, what level of uh, what level can you go in checking the facts? Do you fact check the YouTube's? Uh, do you fact check the printed media's, uh, telegrams, that kinds of uh, things? What level of work you are doing? Thank you. Uh, so uh, as you uh, as you mentioned that uh, we fact check in uh, four languages uh, right now in three languages uh, we are a bit short with uh, a Somali fact checker but uh, we we usually uh, work in four languages so uh, we usually monitor uh, different claims uh, in those languages for example our of a normal uh, fact checker also uh, monitors the 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 Afan Oromo uh, contents and uh, uh, different posts and uh, news and social media uh, controversies. So uh, we try to monitor in uh, all of the languages that, that we are working on. And we try to do the fact checking in uh, all of the languages. And uh, as for, uh, what was the second question? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as for uh, Telegram in the uh, YouTube and other platforms, so we are a bit short in a resource because uh, we are we we have only four fact checkers, so we can't uh, reach all of the platforms and we can't reach all of all of the the contents. And also, uh, I don't know about uh, the others, but uh, in hack check, we we don't have uh, monitoring tools like uh, called named like Crowd Tangle and others. So we usually look for claims manually. So uh, we always scroll down social media platforms to find a false claim manually. So that's a bit uh, challenging for us, uh, but uh, we try to uh, fact check some video contents uh, from YouTube. Uh, and also we try to monitor Telegram, but as I said, uh, due to the shortage of resource uh, manpower and also, um, uh, shortage of tools uh, that are free uh, that are free tools uh, uh, we couldn't reach uh, the whole uh, the wide range of the, the the information disorder in all platforms but we try to uh, touch every platform uh, as 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 much as we can okay uh, the first point that nazi phrased about the uh, you describe it. You describe it as ethnification of stories. Yes, definitely, we are witnessing that, and I think uh, it is not more of a fact-checking issue for me. It is about professionalism. These days, uh, we are witnessing stories in which journalists put their own emotions, uh, make clear their affiliations to their ethnic group, to their religious affiliation, or to the political affiliation to which they uh, belong to. And then you can see them in the stories. Even you can see the feeling, their anger, or their satisfaction or happiness in their stories, uh, which is uh, very troubling for me. I mean, uh, at our association, at the Ethiopian Mass Media Professional Association, what we are trying to do is to raise the level of professionalism of journalists so that uh, whenever they conduct their activities, they not only align um, with their interests, but also to the truth. I mean, there's a saying that for every journalist, his boss or her boss is the truth. But unfortunately, it's not what we are seeing or witnessing in Ethiopia, especially in the regional media outlets. If you have seen some regional media outlets, uh, it's not specific to one region. Uh, you can see an increasing tendency for journalists to become or serve as a propaganda tool for whoever that they claim to belong to. So in the middle of this, there is fact-checking initiative, and it's very difficult to get information, especially from the regional areas. Uh, I have uh, an encounter very recently in which 
I spoke to one official and then he directed me to speak to one other official in the region and then that official redirected me again to another official. So whether it is lack of information or unwillingness to give, uh, it's not clear, but this lack of information is fueling the spread of misinformation because if journalists don't get the information that they deserve, they cannot guess or speculate and write a certain story uh, as a fact checking item. So that's the problem. So I think it's more of lack of professionalism for me. I mean, ethnicizing uh, stories, uh, unfortunately, more and more of, uh, of such stories are coming out. And the other one about the, the stories that you mentioned about the conflict, for example, in Tigray, as I mentioned earlier, if you don't have any information, it's difficult. I mean, there are several claims uh, who, which are made, but those claims uh, to be verified uh, should be fact-checked based on facts on the ground. And uh, the facts on the ground are not available, then nothing can be said. I mean, you might find a lot of activists who might speculate and do or say whatever they want without any facts. But as a fact-checker, we need, we need the facts first. So that's what we are lacking in certain areas. Uh, I mean, fortunately enough for us, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of trust. At least I can speak about it here, Patrick. We get dozens and dozens of uh, claims each and every day, uh, whether it is a scam or a fake page or uh, a claim made by a certain Facebook page or media outlet. By the way, even sometimes we get claims to fact check uh, which comes in the form of a news that is carried by the state media outlets. They will ask us whether this is a story from FANA or EBC or WALTA or the European agency is true or not. The same with the private media outlets. So this shows that because of lack of more and more fact check initiatives, there are a few of them, and then they we are bombarded with the requests. But unfortunately, we cannot deal with, with, with all of them. And also these uh, places that you mentioned, information blackout is so massive that nothing is coming out. And then if you don't get the real facts, then we can speculate. So it will not be fact checked, unfortunately. And for some people, it will continue to be the truth until the truth comes out maybe in the future. Uh, that's the reality. And you ask us also uh, which uh, uh, social media applications that we monitor. I mean, we monitor everything. As I mentioned to you, we are only four people at the desk. I'm the editor. There, are, uh, there is another uh, fact checker working at the Amharic desk and one for Afan Oromo and one for Tigrinya. Uh, we monitor YouTube. Uh, YouTube is a bit difficult always because it's a video, but we also monitor Telegram, Facebook, and Twitter. And as much as possible, we try to come up with whatever uh, response that we get by fact checking the claims. But we do uh, everything, but uh, lack of resources that uh, Rohobot mentioned is tremendous. I mean, we wanted to do more, like we want to do, for example, in certain days, we might do five or six fact-checked items uh, some days, but in some days, like for two consecutive days, we might, not, we, we might not have any story because we might, we might lack the information or uh, to do to some other. So I think capacity building is very important. And that's why I mentioned earlier organizations like Internews, IMS should step in and provide support so that these fucking fact checking initiatives have more resources in which uh, they can play around. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate this because we just dragged you back on stage and you are here. And I really appreciate your time, your insight. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want more information, if you have more questions, these are your people. So Elias from Ethiopia Czech, Robot from Hack Czech, and Kia from Pesa Czech. So talk to them later on. Thank you very much. So uh, now you can go back. I promise I'm not going to drag you back. This is the last time I'm doing this. Thank you so much. All right, so for those of you who can stay, uh, the next session is plenary session and it's live. It's going to be on race and journalism. It has started already online, so we're switching to that. And uh, guests who are staying here after the session, uh, uh, you will be having a group dinner. Uh, and after that, we will have a documentary film screening at eight o'clock. I know it's only you who can who stay here can uh, watch the documentary, but any of you who can stay behind, you're most 